a hay button anvil, many of anvil appreciators will tell you, is the prettiest anvil. They've got just such an elegant proportion between the horn, kind of a preponderance of weight in the bottom of the horn and the length of the horn and the taper, a really graceful sweep to the heel. They're just a beautiful, classic, iconic anvil. Made in the United States, the first domestic anvil manufacturer to really successfully compete with the big manufacturers in Great Britain. Look at the rebound this thing has. Essentially, 100% rebound with a ball bearing. By the way, this is the only way you should ever test the rebound of an anvil. Listen to this beautiful ring. That's the true ring of a forged anvil. And now you know. The weight, 448. The length, 37 inches. The width, 6 inches. The height, 15 and a half inches. It's got an inch and a half hardy hole. From the waist up, it's tool steel. This does not have a hardened face because Haybudden's second generation manufacturing process was solid tool steel from the waist up, from the waist down, it's wrought iron. If you'll notice the face, it's in remarkably good shape. You know, normal sort of wear and tear, light hammer marks in the field of the face, just a few chips knocked off the edges, and you would say, wow, that anvil hasn't been used much. I got this from a man who received it in the entire trove of blacksmith tools that came out of a railroad roundhouse blacksmith shop. Over 400 pieces in my shop now given to me. It's unheard of. I'm profoundly grateful for it. His name was Bill Vianne, and this story is included on my website. Railroad roundhouse blacksmith shop. Heavy work, big work. This anvil and another like it lived there for a long time. And the thing that sets this anvil apart is the evidence of the use that it received in that shop. Can you see all these cut marks? Chops, starting at about the waist, going down, on the sweeps, on both sides. Hundreds of marks. hundreds of center punch marks to the point that the manufacturing logo has been obliterated by punch marks. And you ask yourself, is this Boy Scouts run amok or what's going on? Here's what I've learned. So when the smiths who use this anvil would forge coal chisels or hot cuts or butchers or center punches or other small implements for cutting or marking steel, after they had forged it and hardened it and tempered it, they would test it on the wrought iron portion. And if it cut the wrought iron and did not mar their tool, their testing tool, the bottom of the anvil, indicated appropriate process on their, on their cutting implement. And then contemplate this. Making these small cutting implements was the tiniest fraction of a percentage of the work that was done on this anvil. The real work that was done was heavy, grinding toil to maintain and repair rail cars. So if the tiniest fraction of a percentage of their effort is evidenced by the testing of hundreds of tools, the conclusion is this. There were tens of thousands of man hours of toil and labor expended on the face of this anvil. And yet it is in such great shape. I am the first blacksmith to ever work at this anvil who did not know exactly what he was doing every second. Every other man who worked here was a consummate professional. And that's what makes this anvil, I choose to believe, unique on the face of the earth. I'm so thankful to have it.